All right, what is up, guys? Welcome back to another incredible episode of the Motivation Everything Show. If you are tuning in live right now, I need all of you to drop live below in the comments. I love seeing who tunes in live, who catches the show. If you are watching the replay, drop replay below so we can see who tuned in, who got to see the show. I want to know if you're on Instagram or Facebook or the Motivation Everything community or YouTube as we're streaming to all of them right now. This week, we have a very special guest. I'm really excited to have him on. We're going to dive deep into an interesting topic, developing erotic intelligence for a life that reaches beyond satisfaction and into an enlightenment with Mr. Brandon Alcocer. So guys, help me give him a warm welcome. Brandon is known as a dual threat innovator in the world of sexual and motivational psychology. Brandon Wade Alcocer is a top selling author and college professor whose focus involves promoting erotic intelligence and maximizing the power of arousal states for life optimization. During the past 12 years, he's influenced thousands of students and social media followers with his entertaining and thought-provoking lectures, posts, and novels on improving happiness, health, social skills, sexual expression, and relationships. Brandon, welcome, brother. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Great intro. Absolutely, man. We, we're just we're honored to have you with us, man, and to get to explore this topic with you. Brandon, who are, can you tell us your story, man? Who are you and how did you arrive on talking about erotic intelligence? Uh, well, yeah, the, 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 the quick version is uh, since I was a child, I've always been fascinated with, with human behavior. Like it was just in me to observe, uh, you know, human behavior all around me, observe relationships as a four year old, as a 13 year old. Even in yeah, at middle school, high school, I'd always want to hang with my friends and just talk about human behavior. And they want to talk about sports or whatever. And uh, when I went off to college, um, eventually found my way into studying human development. Um, and uh, uh, after graduating uh, from that, uh, went on to, to graduate school and uh, studied performance psychology. And during that time, I got a job as a matchmaker and a dating coach in, in Beverly Hills. Um, and this was in the in the mid mid 2000s. So it was before Tinder and all that stuff had kind of existed. And um, I learned a lot from that job. Maybe we'll get into that. But again, observing human behavior, taking in all this information. And the thing that I always felt was, OK, I see what's in the textbook. I see some of the academic studies on dating, relationships, sexual expression. But it just didn't seem to line up with what I was observing. We have all these things saying, you know, get married, two kids and a, and a white picket fence and you'll be happy. Yet everywhere I look, I don't see that happening. I see people with a white picket fence and married, two kids, and they're miserable. And the, the husband has a secret family on the side. The wife is banging the gardener and you have all this stuff that's going. Now, yes, there are positive examples, but I'm saying I see more of the, the not what it seems than the opposite. So I can't help but question this. And for me, um, got to the point where I was a college professor and teaching, you know, health classes, sexual psychology, and there were lines of students after my class wanting advice on how to deal with jealousy, how to deal with attracting a mate, all that stuff. Um, and I thought I was giving good advice, but after um, experiencing infidelity from a from a potential fiance, um, which which uh, now I look back, it really wasn't that bad of a case. Basically, I had walked in on her with another woman. Um, that, uh, you know, to my surprise, a lot of men say, oh, that's awesome. I jump in. But at the time I just wasn't prepared for that. And, and, and she, she was French. Um, and she had been honest with me that she was open to that. I just was just blinded to it. And after that happened, I said, okay, I need to, to figure this stuff out because what I'm feeling is not matching what I'm reading in the books and what I'm teaching and what's out there. And I ended up, I live in LA. I, I was living in LA at the time. I ended up going on this journey where I went to Las Vegas about twice a month for about seven years. And I went on this wild journey of Vegas is a place where you can observe, you know, human behavior, I think in its rawest form. And yes, it's to the extreme for sure. But I was able to go there and just put myself in all kinds of crazy situations with, with uh, lots of different types of people. And uh, through that, that's how I wrote this book called The Experience. Mm. which it's a, it's a, it's a novel, but I, it's labeled as a, a erotic self-help thriller. And it's about a college professor who, who gets cheated on and runs off to Vegas and needs to find answers. And basically this is a, it's about probably, you know, semi about 30% true. And then, you know, 70% of just, I had to create a cool story around what I learned. 
Um, and, uh, you know, that's the quick and dirty of how I got to where I'm at. And since then, I mean, lots of people have read the book. There's been people that found, realized that they were living in a cult or, you know, living in some really strange situations that they needed to escape. And it was the book that gave them permission to connect with their sexual energy because it's different than what they've been taught. And, and, and they find basically their enlightenment through this kind of path. So it's really about, you know, understanding your sexual energy and, and giving yourself permission to do that and, and working through the, the muck of what, what we've been taught. Mm. Yeah, that's so interesting. And, you know, I think so many people struggle with this topic mm -hmm. when it comes to sex, when it comes to sexual energy, when it comes to having communication about this and understanding ourselves, I think it becomes an uncomfortable topic. Mm -hmm. So many of us push it to the side and we never talk about it. But, but it's real. It's something that we experience that we all have. How, how does one understand their sexual energy better? Can you take us more down that journey? You've yeah. been on this path. You've wrote a book on it. For those watching that are like, man, I just I feel in general uncomfortable talking about this. How do I even begin to better understand it? It, yeah, yeah, it's it is it is tricky, and and depending on you know where you grew up and how you grew up and all that kind of stuff. I do need to to say that um, everybody has different levels of sexual energy, and there's on a scale of one to ten, ten being extreme, and then one being you know you're almost asexual, where you really just it's just not in you, and that's fine. So there is a genetic factor. Um, people that are a one, two, or three, where it's just naturally very very low, they might hear this conversation and they, they can't quite connect with it or they can say, Oh, well that might apply to my friend, but they know that they're pretty much asexual. And then there's the opposite where there's a people who are a 10, it doesn't matter what system they grew up in. They're just going to be expressing themselves. And there are people who, who see careers in adult film or in the sex industry, not because they have daddy issues, but because it's an art form to them. And it, it's just in them to express themselves that way. So those are the extremes. My concern is the people that are in the middle. And if you're a five or a six or a seven, you grew up in some system that taught you to repress it. That's where that's dangerous. That can lead to, especially with men, violence and a lot of depression and, and issues. Um, and so, so keeping that in mind, you know, for the listeners, think about, okay, where am I at on that scale? And if you're somewhere in the middle where it's like, yeah, I don't quite know. Cool. That then, then this is, you know, definitely for you. So how does one know? Well, um, and you know, there's a lot of it where it's just kind of in your gut you, if there's something there. Uh, but a, a big part is, is I would say, are you connected to your shadow? Have you done any shadow work exploring your dark side? Is there this urge for me? It was this urge. I'd never been in a strip club and I'm a 29 year old college professor at the time. And this, there's a story in the book. I, I, I go to Vegas. I say, all right, you know what? I'm going to break some of my rules here and just, just do this. I, I drive to a strip club. I remember hearing an ad on the radio. I didn't have a ton of money. And it says, if you come to this strip club by five o'clock PM, you'll get in free. And I thought, okay, well, you know, I'm just going to go there at five o'clock and maybe there's nobody there. I drive to the parking lot and I'm, I'm holding the steering wheel shaking and everything inside of me wants to go in the, in the strip club just to see it, just to smell it. But my brain had all of this repression said, no, you can't, you're bad. What if somebody sees you, you might lose your job. You might blah, 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 blah. I'm like, and it's just people dancing and, in, in, you know, it's just humans showing their skin. Nobody's punching each other or anything like that. It's not violent. And so, but the key is that this urge, this little tinge of an urge was there. And that's enough to, to say, well, I might need to explore that. And for everybody, it's a little bit different, but it, as you go through your day, what's that little tinge of an urge and, and, and see if that needs to be explored. In some cases, you might go down that rabbit hole and, and maybe you walk in the street and say, ah, I did it, it really wasn't for me. And at least I can check that off the list. Cool, okay, move on to the next thing. Now for me, it opened up a whole new world and I realized, oh wow, there's this force inside of me that I've been denying my whole life. And, and it, I knew that I wouldn't know who I was unless I fully explored this force. Um, so I hope I hope that 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 helps. It's really about okay, just yeah, those little those little things that that, that you maybe won't even tell anybody, or you'll tell just one friend because you know they won't judge you. That's kind of how how you'll one one way to figure out your your sexual yeah, energy. It's interesting because you said you know repression can lead to all these things, even anger, yeah. and violence, and depression, and stress, and things like that. Yeah. And, how many people out there do you think that they feel these urges and they immediately shun themselves and are ashamed of these feelings that they have? So they repress it, which then causes even more issues from that repression. Most people, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it maybe I might be exaggerating, but 90% 
of humans, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and again, this is all assuming somebody is you know, over the age of 21. I think below that, you don't quite know what's going on and everything. So adults where we can, we have enough life experience to get in tune with it. Um, uh, but the, it, what's important is for people to, you know, have, have you studied the history of marriage? Do you, you know, and erotic intelligence is basically learning about the history of eroticism, learning about your own eroticism and learning about how that it applies to human nature. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's a lot of work being done where they're studying bonobos and bonobos are like, uh, basically orangutans. Um, we're a 97% genetic match, DNA match with, with uh, orangutans and, and gorillas and things like that. Bonobos were a 99% genetic match. Um, and uh, the reason why, and I, I know that, that there, there are, you know, religious people that might listen to this and the idea of evolution is a little hands, and that, that's totally fine. You don't have to believe in evolution, but just pay attention, at least it's worthwhile to notice, 99% genetic match. There's something there as far as observing their behavior that might apply to us. So with bonobos, um, uh, they are the friendliest of the primate community. They don't fight, they don't war, whereas uh, uh, orangutans and everything, they'll rip each other's arms off and the males are always fighting and battling to be the alpha and all this stuff. Um, whereas the bonobos are very, very friendly. They're female-led societies. They're female-led societies. And this has uh, sparked the belief that up until about 10,000 years ago, and you'll get about half the anthropologists who do buy this theory and then the other half, are, they're not quite sure yet. But up until about 10,000 years ago, most societies, human societies, were led by females. And mm. it was, and there was no evidence of war. There was no evidence of violence. Um, and they, they do this by studying the, the bodies that they found. There's no you know, knives and stuff, and they're all perfectly well kept. Um, and, uh, and the bonobos, back to them, they have, they have sex on average per day with eight to 10 different partners. So a female bonobo, she'll have sex with, with five women and maybe four men every single day. They're a very sexually active community. And it's bonobos, dolphins, and humans are the only animals on the planet that we know of that have sex for pleasure, for reasons other than reproduction. Um, and so in studying these communities, the, the bonobo communities, which they're only located in the Congo, um, that we're getting a lot of really interesting insight that, that applies to, to human behavior. So how, so flash forward to, you know, 10,000 years ago, and most societies were female led, um, the, the, the belief was, and when they studied the ancient tribes, sexual expression was used not just for reproduction, but as a healing mechanism, as a way to build community, as a way to, to if somebody is violent, it's a way to, de to basically take the violence out of them. Um, and uh, it, it, it basically strengthens the pack. Um, and so uh, it was the invention of agriculture 10,000 years ago, where women were actually about the same size as men. Once agriculture came along, uh, the, 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 the idea of owning a property was developed and the, the men, uh, had to use a plow, which meant their forearms got bigger. They were able to take the power from the women. Oh, I need to back up. Uh, the thing that you'll observe in every primate society is the male monkeys or the male bonobos are always look, scheming to take the power from the women. They're always scheming to take the power. Um, and, uh, they believe that this was also true in humans. And it wasn't until the invention of agriculture where men finally developed the strength to get the power from the women. Um, and, uh, they, with agriculture, they started viewing, they, they said, okay, I have this property, um, of the men, I have this property. Who am I going to pass it on to? I need to know who my children are. Um, because before that, everybody was having sex with everybody. They knew who the moms were. They didn't know who the dads were. Um, and so they invented this concept of what we have today as, as marriage. Basically, okay, you two people, you have kids, and your kids, the offspring, will then keep this property once you die. Um, and after that, then the men figured out how to keep the women up in the house. And they say, you don't work on the land. And the men got stronger. The women got basically more curvy, more fatter, because that's what you get when you're, you're giving babies. Um, and from that point, the men have had the power ever since. And they put in all of these systems to guarantee that they keep the power forever. So that's where you'll see things like, oh, we must make sure that the women are having lots of babies and all this kind of stuff, because it basically takes the power away from the women and keeps it on the men. So when you're seeing things like a sex positive society um, and the idea of sexual repression and all this stuff, it's basically a method to keep the men in power and keep the women uh, down low. Um, and I know I jumped all over the place on that, but, but uh, uh, there's a lot going on with it's more than just what your parents taught you and what you think you should do or what you might be getting from, from some higher up in, in your uh, belief system. 
Man, that's that's interesting. You know, Brandon, I've never heard that before. So you're saying that there is a possibility that that at one time we were a woman led society. Yeah. And that over time with agriculture and land, that man assumed that powerful position. Yeah. So I guess my question with that is with let's say let's say this is true. And so what changed? What created issues within erotic intelligence? as this pattern began to happen, as we began to get molded in this direction, what did that cause? What was the ripple effect of that? So the, yeah, the, the, there was a, a belief that if people were free with their sexual uh, expression, they would actually, they would be more powerful and they'd be less uh, um, easy to control. And so if you teach and you promote sexual repression, it actually, it almost like kills, you could say, 40% of the brain to where they're not connected to that superpower makes people easier to control. And you can see examples of this throughout history. Um, Hitler did it really, really well. As soon as he rose into power, the number one thing he did was uh, make uh, all, all non-marriage sex acts illegal, masturbation, you could get arrested for it, created a bunch of fear around sex. And, and when somebody is in that state, it makes their brain a little more easy to, to program to get them to do what you want because the brain is designed to go seek these, these opportunities for not only reproduction, but even in the case of somebody being, uh, uh, you know, gay or, 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 or trans or whatever it might be, it's really for, for human connection. So there's a lot of motivation there if you're in a position of power to keep your people away from knowing their, their sexual self. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and unfortunately, this also is something that leads to a lot more violence too. You can get men to be a lot more violent if you promote uh, separation from their, their, their sexual self. Mm, that's, that's interesting. So, you know, we, we live in a society where you, you could argue this has very much happened, right? Mm -hmm. Sexual energy has very much been repressed and, it, and it's completely viewed in that point that you shouldn't be, you know, having sex with just anyone and doing this and that. And, you know, as a spiritual man, I, I struggle, mm -hmm. you know, with this, 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 even this theory that we're talking about today but I'm, I'm, I'm always curious to explore and go down this rabbit hole. You know, it's like how, in what ways, cause like there's a thing that I've seen where I've met a lot of people in successful positions mm -hmm. and a common theme I've seen with successful men is they are highly sexed. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious on your theories behind this, when one begins to channel that sexual energy, how they can become more productive and successful in their life. Can you take us a little bit down why that is? What sexual energy does erotic intelligence and harnessing that instead of repressing it and how that actually makes us be more us? Oh, this is a, a great question. And, and the first thing I want to, I also want to add to what I just said, and it's in line with this question is I'm not saying that we all need to go out and start having orgies because that's the way the bonobos did it. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that if somebody is in a traditional relationship you know, and they want to save themselves just for their part. That's totally fine. Hopefully this just gives you permission to know that there's power. Like you guys need to do, if it's in you, do some kinky stuff, like explore it beyond just the basic and know that sex shouldn't just be, I get off, you get off. It's, it's, it's a healing practice. Oh, you're sick. Uh, the, the Wendat tribe, which was based out of Michigan, um, this, this Indian tribe up until the 1800s, they had this tradition. They are the, the last female led society in America, especially with Indians. Um, uh, Native Americans, excuse me. Uh, they had the ceremony where if a woman or, or even a, a male was sick, they put them on a throne in the center of their village and all the women in the village would come around and, and, and they would, the woman would, the sick person would do some kind of thing and poof, all the women would run off and grab any male of their choice. They'd come back, everybody would rip off all their clothes and they would have this giant sexual act as a healing mechanism to the woman who's sick in the throne. And this is something, a tradition they carried on for hundreds and hundreds of years. They wouldn't keep doing it if it didn't work. Now, we didn't have, we don't have a way to measure if it worked or not. But what I'm saying is there's something there that we're not tapped into as long as we keep promoting repression. Now, mm -hmm. the other side of this, and you mentioned businessmen, in my, in my trips to Vegas, I saw many, 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 many businessmen who were married, who were very, very wealthy, who were doing all kinds of stuff that, quote unquote, they, they shouldn't be doing. There's a big difference between erotic expression for escapism an erotic expression for life well-being. Mm. And that's the key point. 
So, so if somebody wants to, to express themselves sexually, are you doing it for escapism or are you seeking to improve the life of your partner and yourself? Are you touching them in a way that is, again, for escapism? Or are you touching in a way that you think what's beyond the, the, the wrists and, and all the sensory responders in there that you know is igniting their brain and creating these fireworks that then help them help the food taste better the next day because of the sensory experience that you got them? It's more than 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 just reproduction, and it's more than just oh, an orgasm to give me a little bit of dopamine for a couple minutes. There's a lot more to it. Um, so your your question with business um, or you know entrepreneurs, um, I I had a client I was coaching. Uh, she is a very wealthy uh, female entrepreneur, and um, she wanted to infuse sexual expression because she saw she could feel the power, but obviously she wasn't sure how she should bring that energy into a room full of CEOs of major, major corporations. And uh, together we, we, we came up with this idea of her to wear sexy lingerie underneath her business suit. Now, what's key is she was buttoned up. Nobody knew she had it on, but she could feel it against her skin. Okay. And when she's having that part, when she's feeling sex and she's not flirting with them or anything, it's just a power, like a power stance we do with body language. It's on those lines of you present yourself in a certain way. And she says, it's amazing how lighter and playful the men got. And they weren't playing in a flirting way. It was just from the stiff business meeting to ah, just as if you're, you know, having golf and just chit chatting and all this stuff, it shifts the energy. Um, and so even if you're a male, are, do you pay attention to your suit and think of it? Am I dressed in a, a nice way? You could say, am I dressed sexy? Um, you know, wearing this polished suit with nice shoes and how you present yourself. If you feel about good about how you look, you're going to bring a certain energy into the room. And yes, I 100% agree with that. When you look and, good, you feel good, you right. do good. And that, that energy can be sexual. It doesn't mean you're going to rip each other's clothes off. It has nothing to do with that. It just, it, if, if you were to scan the brain when you're dressed that way, you're going to see it firing up in a way that's more alert, more control, more able to do things in a more productive way. Um, and to deny yourself that is, is like, you know, taking away one of your best weapons to navigate the world. Why, why do that? Hmm. So I had somebody who, uh, a comment, and I'm going to throw it up here as well, and I'm going to read it to you. So Chanel says, I've always felt that as long as I can learn to suppress my sexuality and have not control, then I'm least likely to have my choices be led by it. For instance, staying in a relationship, I know I should leave, but I stay because of the sex. I think this is very common mm -hmm. in today's society, especially with women, where they're, mm -hmm. they're in a toxic relationship. And, and they know they shouldn't be in it, but they constantly are coming back to it because of the sex, because of the sexual energy. What advice would you give her? It, it, on, I'm honest here. I'm going to, I don't know if it'll show or not. Um, the, it's whoever you date is equal. The psychological well being of whoever you date is always equal to your own psychological well being. So on a scale of zero to a hundred, um, I don't know if this, this will show. Can, yeah, uh, you can kind of, uh, maybe. there we go. Okay. Uh, not quite. I'll just do it verbally. If you're a 40 out of a hundred, meaning uh, as far as self-love, self-confidence, happiness with your own life, the best you're going to date is either a 40 or less. And this is what I observed when I was a matchmaker and a dating coach. So wherever you're at with your own psychological well-being is equal to who you're attracted to. Okay. So the key then is if you find yourself only matched with people that, okay, yeah, the sex is great, but that's, that is one factor. There's probably some work to do on self to boost yourself up to that scale. So when I was a match, matchmaker, I'd say, well, who do you want to date? Well, I'm going to date somebody that's a 90. Okay, great. Do the work to, to make sure that, that you're a 90, like listening to this show. So you get points for showing up listening to this show. Do you go to the, the gym? And this doesn't mean you have to be you know beautiful. You have to feel beautiful from the inside. But it, if anything, just kind of look at it as, okay, this is who I'm attracting in my life. Like attract like, right? And I want to find somebody. But I guarantee that there are people out there with high psychological well, well-being who absolutely know what they're doing sexually. Um, uh, and so if you can you know, find a way to separate from that. I would not you choose to use sexual oppression as a tool. I would use it as, okay, I'm, I'm attracted to this type. What does that say about me? And what do I need to work on myself? Um, and, and use it as just like a flag post, like, okay, signal I need to work on myself. Cool. I'm going to break up with this. 
um, you know, uh, do that self work on yourself, right. which is fall, so important. Fall in love with being along. Yeah. I think that that's the, the common trend too is, and I'm curious your thoughts on this. So when somebody is in a toxic relationship mm -hmm. and they leave that toxic relationship, they finally, they do that. They cut it off, right? They make the decision that I want better. I deserve better in my life. A lot of people don't take that time alone that self work on that inner self to then prepare them and level them up from the 40 to the 90 to attract the 90. Yeah. They, they keep attracting the 40 or less. Yeah. And they keep asking my, themselves, why do I attract shitty guys? Why do I attract shitty girls? I guess like, I mean, you were a matchmaker. What advice for somebody that wants to work on themselves would you give? Um, well, and the angle I take, and some people may not be comfortable with this, but date a lot of people. That doesn't mean you have to sleep with a lot of people, but date a lot of people and you'll get these things uh, where you can compare. When you hang out with people, it's it's you'll get these uh, knowledge about yourself. It's very hard, especially right now in quarantine. I've been by myself for about eight months. It's really hard to learn about myself without having something to bounce it off of. So, so dating a variety of people, that doesn't mean you have to sleep with a bunch of people, but exposing yourself to a variety of situations, people from different backgrounds, you're going to learn more about what you need to work on. And, and each of those experiences should give you a little nudge up, uh, you know, but it, it's, it's some of the basic stuff of, of self-care, self-love, you know, fitness, health, well-being, have a counselor, you know, are there things in your life that, that need to be explored? I think we should all seek counseling. I love counseling. You get to talk about yourself for an hour. Like what other business gives you permission to do that? Like, I think that's fun. Um, but, uh, uh, um, and the other thing I said, like in that, that woman's example, um, you could also still date that person if the sex is great, but shift your mindset on it that, that, oh, we, I have a, a, a fun relationship with this person. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all sex. And I get to learn a little bit how my body feels. Um, cause you, a lot of times you won't know how your body feels unless you're with somebody who knows how to touch those buttons. Right. Um, so there's value in all those things. Just shift your perspective on it. Um, if we save ourselves for that one person, okay, I understand that that exists, but man, I don't meet many people that have done that and have ended up super happy. Um, mm -hmm. um, and again, this goes back to where are you at on that sex scale? If you're a one, two or three, then it, and it feels more comfortable, save yourself one person that that's totally fine. And you may find somebody that's in that category, but if you're a six, seven, eight, nine or 10, you're probably going to be a lot happier dating a variety of people and knowing that it's totally fine to just, to just date. It's absolutely fine. Um, and that goes back to if we observe bonobos and, and some of those ancient societies, that's what led to less war, to greater human connection, to a lot more love and kindness. Mm. Is there any science that backs up um, higher productivity in one's life with um, higher sexuality? Yes. So, um, or, or higher sexuality, like connect under like connection to it. Um, yeah. yeah, I guess yeah. being more in tune with your sexual self. Yeah. Uh, you know, because that's an interesting thing that I've I've heard talked about. You know, before I'm just curious your thoughts on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, there's it, it's such a powerful force inside of our body, and if we we don't understand it, and it just fires off in these different ways, you might have these freak out sessions, or these angry sessions, or these jealous moments that you can't source where it's coming from, and that can take up zap a lot of your mental energy that could be used towards building your business, being a good parent, being a good friend, all that kind of stuff. And when, and so, so I'm kind of reverse engineering your question. Uh, but, but once you get to that place of, okay, I understand my, you know, my sexual identity, I feel comfortable with these things and, and, and confident doing these things. It, it'll be, you know, it, it's just peace of mind. It, you know, it gets you that clear, you know, place. Um, aside from that, there was a, a, a fun study. I'm going off the top of my head, so it might be slightly off, but, um, what they did was, um, you had three different uh, test groups. They said, okay, memorize, yeah, we're gonna give you a list of 20 words, random words, truck, banana, you know, orange peel, uh, tree. You have 10 seconds to memorize these 20 words as best you can. Group one, uh, just do the best you can. Um, and uh, if you get like 15 out of 20 correct, we'll give you 50 bucks. Group two, if you get 15 out of 20 correct, you get to watch an erotic film of your choice. And then group three, you're going to watch an erotic film of your choice first and then take the quiz. And what ended up happening, they, they hypothesized that the, the group motivated for money was going to do the best 
turns out they did the worst. <laughs> that that when they scanned the brain, the group that was motivated for money, you only saw a tiny part of the, the frontal lobe light up. Basically, the rest of the brain wasn't really active because it was just focused on making money. Money is a new, is a newer thing. Our brain, our ancestral brain, doesn't really recognize money the way it recognizes sexual opportunities. Money has only been around for about five thousand years, and the human brain, to the best that we know, is around two million years. Um, and so it hasn't evolved to really associate power with money. So um, uh, infusing. So the the group then that that had sex as the reward, they did equally as well as the group that that had a, a erotic viewing opportunity and then took the test. So both of these performed equally as well. And I forget the actual stats, but there's something there that that uh, our quote unquote sex brain has again, powers that at least can help you memorize things in, in, in a short amount of time. And, I, and, and with regardless of the study, for those people who might be dating or even with your spouse, when it's date night, do you notice a certain level of kind of uppityness throughout the day? Especially if it's a brand new first date, all of a sudden, you, you know, you're ironing your shirt and your house is a lot cleaner. You're getting your hair done, your nails done. And there's this hyper focus that kicks in. That's the brain, you know, that I'm talking about. Versus, oh, I got to make money today. I'm focused on sales. That's all willpower dragging your feet. But when you figure out how to infuse the sexual energy there, it's like this, this boost that comes along with it. And again, that doesn't mean you have to go out and sleep with a bunch of people. There's, I, all I want you to, people to understand is there's a source there to connect with. And it's mm. going to be up to you to figure out kind of how to do it in your style. Mm. Hyper focus. Tell me more about that. That intrigues me. I'm sure that intrigues a lot of people. You're 100% right. Yeah. I think about anytime I go on a new date, right? Like how excited I am, mm -hmm. how focused I am, how like attention to detail I am. And, and that state of mind, it's almost like I can feel the chemicals in my body firing on all cylinders. And I want more of that. Yeah. I think we all want more of that. We all want to be more, more, I more focused, <laughs> the best version of ourself. Yeah. So of repressing that, how do we tap into that more? Oh man, I got I have goosebumps from your question. That that's sign of a great question. I mean, I've had it a few times here. You're just man, you're hitting it. And I I joke that man, if the the amount of energy I put into a date, if I could do that with a business, God, I'd be a billionaire like tomorrow. Like it's an and for me, it's an ins, it's a I don't want to say insane. I I have a hyper amount of energy as far as the sexual stuff. So one. I haven't quite figured that out yet, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> I but, think if you did, I, you would be a billionaire. But that's the whole thing, and, and that's what this mission is. There's something there. How how can you you can relate to this? How do we make that into into the other parts of our life? And um, I wish you know, I, if I could think of it, you know, if there was an example that we could explore, I might be able to come up with an idea. But off off the top of my head, I could just say that's my daily search is to figure the answer to that. You know, it's, it's just interesting because sexual energy is the biggest driving force that we have. It's proven science backs it. Yeah. Like it is the one thing that will get you more motivated than anything in this world, including yeah. money. Like you said, money's very new. You kind of helped me draw an example about how money's only been around 5,000 years. Our brain's yeah. been developing for 2 million. We yeah. have three parts of the brain. We have that older primal brain. We have the midbrain and we have that, you know, neocortex or frontal yeah. Lobe. And it's, it's interesting because I guess I'm fascinated and I'm sure a lot of people that are like being high performers of how do I channel that into other areas of my life? And I'm just curious, like, I know that you might not even know the answer, but what, what have you done that works for you or what advice could you give us? Well, um, the, one angle and, and this, I, I share this because I, I it's not, actually studied. I'm just kind of taking tidbits of what's out there and, and infusing it. And I, I like to think of myself as more of an innovator than just somebody that regurgitates the stuff that's out there. So this is the thing that I've kind of working on innovating is, is incorporating. Um, I, well, I, here, when, when you and I chatted uh, before, um, you had mentioned, you know, like it's famous for boxers, for fighters to not have orgasm, you know, the week before their event or whatever it might be. Yeah, they suppress and, their TV. So it's, yeah, yeah. 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 And that that's one way I would argue uh, as a uh, Go, especially off the example I just shared from the study that if the, let's say the fighter was married, that what I would want to do if I was a trainer of this fighter is I would sp speak to the wife if she's okay with this, that look, I want you to guys to have sex. Um, and as you're providing him this erotic opportunity, his brain's going to be lighting up, wanting to memorize everything that's taking place in this sexual opportunity. Um, and he's going to close his eyes and visualize every step of the fight. 
Mm. And when eroticism is, is connected to memorization, it basically tattoos whatever you're thinking about onto your brain. And so, and I'll, I'll ask the audience a question and, and, and uh, to help prove this point, the, the, the fast food chain out here on the West coast is called Carl's Jr. On the East coast is called Hardee's, right? Right. Um, can somebody picture a Carl's Jr. commercial from 2016, just what, five years ago? Okay. Probably not. Think really hard. Okay. Now, can somebody picture a Carl's Jr. commercial from 2008? Is there anybody who could chime in maybe on the notes, whatever? What's the Carl's Jr. commercial from 2008? Maybe you couldn't figure out one from 2016, but from 2008, it's crystal clear. Hmm. Do you, does that ring a bell for you? You know, I lived East Coast where it was Hardee's okay. back then. And so Carl's Jr. is a little newer to me just getting out on the West Coast. All right. I, I, maybe Hardee's didn't have this commercial. I'm not sure. But it was very famous for having attractive women ride a bull and eat the cheeseburger on the bull. Did you see that growing up? I don't think I did. Okay. So maybe that's a West Coast thing. Um, uh, but the, the idea is they stopped doing that commercial and they did it around 2008. So whenever I ask that question, people are like, oh, yeah, it was, it was Jessica Simpson riding a bull, eating a, eating a, a cheeseburger, falling all over her face. Um, and the, the whole thing with that is, is your brain is going to remember uh, erotic images uh, and things associated ero erotic images more than just a basic image. And that's why you'll see a lot of sex and advertising. And so back to the fighter, I'd want him during an erotic session, his brain's firing, trying to memorize, because what the brain wants to do is always guide you to reproduction opportunities. So it's taking in data. Okay, right now I'm having a reproduction opportunity. What are the things that lead to this? And, and what's cool is, and this is my performance psychology background, when we do visualization, the brain doesn't really know the difference between the external and the internal. So if he's visualizing the fight while having sex and the steps of the fight, it's likely that, that he'll perform better uh, during the fight, seeing things kind of happen in slow motion. So, um, uh, I, I hope, hope that makes sense. I wish my cars in here, <laughs> nobody commented that they got it. That, okay. No, uh, unfortunately not on that. But uh, I, I, okay. Sex does sell. That's yeah. why I used it for. So and, and I know people can at least relate to that. They've seen it in advertising. And even if, if you're not attracted or if, you know, you know, Pepsi every year has, you know, Cardi B and, and Nicki Minaj and Britney Spears and Cindy Crawford advertising their sodas. And most people, you know, um, it's easy for them to notice that, but I'm sorry. I lost the train of thought. I go, the Carl's Jr. thing threw me off. <laughs> so, no worries. I was like, no, no. I go to move. Oh. <laughs> no, it's good. It's interesting though, how memorization is increased yeah. by eroticism. And, and I wonder if moving forward as society continues to evolve in the rapid pace that we are, if we will dial in how to use that more and more to our benefit to, to accomplish and do more. Ah, oh, yeah. Um, it, yeah, I think so. Um, you know, one of the things that, that is, is going to be increasing and again, I, it's very hard to do sex research. And so that's why for those of you who are hardcore kind of science, I need the facts, I need the studies. It, I, it's, it's really hard to, to piece together. Oh, I know I was going to talk about masturbating, um, on this in my answer to the last question, but I'll get, remind me to get there in a second. Okay. Um, but uh, in, in studying uh, sex, it's very hard because when they do it at a university, they bring in students. They're in this stiff white room. They give them a survey to fill out. Well, these students, they don't know if their parents are going to see it or who's, you know, the dean's going to see this list, whatever. So they're not going to answer honestly. So a lot of the data that, that these places are getting on, on sex is, is really not, not that accurate. It's tough to study. But um, what's being developed are, for lack of better words, sex robots. Um, and I know that that's a scary thought for some people. They, they do exist um, and they're getting real, real close to looking very, very human. Um, and the purpose from an academic perspective is that it'll help uh, with the research that you can put, you know, something in, in a microchip in somebody's head and have them spend two weeks with the doll at home and they can analyze what was going on in the body while this erotic experience was happening and it, in a truly academic setting. And for those of you who say, oh, that's creepy. I don't know. Look, everybody has a sex robot in their home already. It just doesn't look like one. It's in the shape of a phone or a computer screen. But um, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, it's very, very, very similar. And, and, you know, and there's sex toys and all those kind of things, which, which I think are, again, are important. If you go into it with the intent of I'm using this to better my life, if you go into it with escapism or shame, it's just going to double down on that emotion. 
Um, and so, yeah, especially like with masturbation, one of the things that they have found in studying masturbation is it can lead to depression. It can lead to, to impotence and things like that if it's viewed as shameful. But when it's viewed as a productive thing, not sarcastically, legit, like I'm engaging in this act right now. I set the intention beforehand. Um, and so and this is what I was going to share. One of the things I'm experimenting with is doing the visualization in an erotic state. So for those of you who are curious about manifesting and, and really programming your brain to want things and to have a driving force. If you are setting down for a self pleasure session, as you get yourself aroused, the amygdala opens up and it's memorizing everything that's taking place. And if you decide to have a visualization of I'm going to be a CEO and I'm, I'm going to own this company and things are going great. And you just do that for 20 seconds while you're in an arousal state, you bring yourself to orgasm. What it does is it tattoos that image on your brain. And as you go through the day, the brain then says, all right, we need to guide you towards reproduction opportunities. Well, then it's time for you to be uh, more motivated to focus on getting that task done for the day to get you to that CEO position. Mm. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And it's, it's, I, I can see that because I understand that that part of our brain, like our body is designed for us to reproduce. Right. So anytime it's put into that state of arousal towards that, the brain is functioning at a higher level and capacity. And then you can almost trick it by yeah. using visualization, memorization, and things like that right. while you're in this peak state, let's call it, yeah. to then you know, work to your advantage. And, and yeah. it's interesting because, I mean, it, people have been doing it. High performers have been using um, sexuality for, to their advantage for a long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, uh, I'm sure some of the, you know, the listeners are thinking about the think and grow rich, you know, sex transmuta transmutation theory, um, which, which it, it can work, which is more of, of, in a way, harnessing your sexual energy and not using it in masturbatory uh, fashion or whatever to kind of let it build up. And then there's a driving force for that too. And yes, that's, that's one way if, if you want, but I, I would argue that you could, you know, it might be more effective to bring yourself to orgasm and to actually allow that stuff to be expressed. Um, again, um, there's a difference between if somebody's masturbating 10 times a day, that's addiction, that's misuse or abuse of the skill. If we're talking once a day, twice a day, fully intent to, to, to be better with it, then I think it can be a productive way. And I want to make sure that that's clear. But, mm -hmm. um, um, and if somebody, if they can't control, they're, they're better off just saying no, um, like they can, they have an addictive personality, then, then the sexual transmutation might be a better tactic for them to, to do the no that no, uh, what's the non masturbation term, but to just ignore that and let it, let it build up that that's fine too. Um, but as long the key with all of this is, are, have you made decisions about your sexuality? Are, are you, are you in tune with it? Do you know it? Or is it just kind of floating in the wind and you're just let, kind of nudging it off to the side? Cause then it's going to, it's going to eat at you. It's one of the most important parts of our human experience. And we should at least, you know, if you decide, you know what, I'm going to become a nun and just totally cut it off for the rest of the oh, Cool, cool. At least you made that decision. At least you're not on the fence, right? Yeah, intention. Um, you know, my yeah. theme for this year is intentionality. Right. How does one become more intentional about their sexuality? I think for, the, 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 for starters is to study, you know, the history, to get a, a different idea of what it's about than the mainstream of what, at least in America, what we've been taught in elementary school and, and through our, you know, our parents or whatever it is that the, the stuff that's coming out now that we have the ability and the, to, to measure certain things in ancient societies and all this, that there's going to be a new wave of, of how we view all these things and to at least start with an open mind to say, OK, there's there might be things worth worth exploring that I may not need to believe what my grandma tells me about it. You know, you know, grandma, let's say a grandma from a from a Latin family saying, well, this is what you know, what, what my culture did. And, and um, uh, you know, my her grandma in South America and her grandma in South America all followed this thing based on some some doctrine. Um, but if you look at the history, you say, well, there's a good chance that if, if my ancestry is from somewhere in South America, that my great, 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 great grandma was raped and believing these things. And, that, and that's a very effective strategy to get somebody's brain to switch. And I am sorry for taking it to that route. But what I, I want people to understand is don't be afraid to go into the history of whatever your, your, your family structure is and your cultural structure is to see if, if how you're genetically built lines up with that. And if it does, then, then stick with it. The other thing I, I'd like to share is I, I believe that we need, there's always a 50-50 split. The brain learns by comparing opposites. The brain is a duality mechanism, meaning... The brain knows something's hot because it's experienced something cold. 
the brain knows you're dating somebody amazing because you've dated some not so amazing people. It doesn't really learn things singularly. And that, again, that's where the value of multiple experiences comes into play. I think that we need to have super religious people out there and super non-religious people out there to help us understand each other. If we all just went for the same kind of path, there wouldn't be any, any kind of friction to really boost and develop our, our species and our knowledge and our growth. So I, that's why I say when I say all these things, whatever your belief system is and however you're wired, that please, you know, be you. Um, we're not all going to be the same, um, but give yourself permission to at least explore. And if you, if you do, and like back to my strip club example, you know, you go there and you realize it's not for you. Cool. Check it off the list. No big deal. But also what happens is when you do that, you won't be as judgmental towards people who, um, uh, might enjoy that activity of human beings touching each other for the exchange of money. <laughs> um, you know, and a, a big lesson I learned in my, my whole, my whole journey, you know, in, in this is, uh, I used to be very judgmental on people with tattoos. Um, I would find that, God, how could somebody do that? And I didn't grow up in a religious system or anything. It was just there. I would be, you know, judgmental. And, and on my 30th birthday, went to dinner with my mom and I was going through this huge life transformation and our, our server had a bunch of tattoos on her arm. My mom asked, you ever think about getting a tattoo? And I said, well, actually the last three weeks I've had a dream where I have one on my chest. And um, she said, you should do it. And it floored me that my mom would say that. We finished our dinner, we went right to the tattoo shop. I got a tattoo on my 30th birthday uh, uh, in honor of Bruce Lee, it's from Enter the Dragon, I'm a big Bruce Lee fan. So, hey. um, but what was interesting is the moment I got this, all the judgment went away. Uh, towards people with tattoos there was i have it just like boom instantly went away you and know it's interesting you say that you know i i'm inked up and i i guess in my younger years i was judgmental of people with tattoos yeah. too and so with that how does this tie to sex well if somebody is very judgmental towards other people's sexual expression it's possible that there's something in you that's not being released I like to say there's an erotic ghost that's stuck in a cage inside of your soul and you mm -hmm. need to free it to really know who you are. And it could be that maybe you're with a partner who, who isn't comfortable with that. Um, and it, it's up to you to either, you know, work on that or perhaps find, find a different partner. Um, but we're going to be moving into an era that's very sex positive. There's a lot of polyamory talk now, and there's a lot of science being studied on, on that where you can have multiple relationships with multiple people at the same time. Um, and this is all stemming from the anthropological studies. It's not just, oh, I'm freaky and I need to express it. No, there's legit things going on of observing human behavior. Okay, these were how things were in, the, in ancient times. There was a lot less crime, a lot less violence, a lot less all this stuff. Well, maybe there's something there worth exploring. And there's still communities in the world that, that have polyamorous relationships, tribal communities and that are female led and that, you know, that are doing just fine. So again, if, if, if there's something in you, a twinge in you that needs to be explored, all I want to give people is permission to, to check it out. Um, right. It's so important. You know, you're, um, you're big on shadow work and you know, what is the power of understanding your shadow? The shadow, yeah. So the the, the dark side. It's a, a you know a Jungian theory that we all have this part of ourselves that we're afraid to admit is there. Um, and for me, growing up, it was my my sexual self. And and for those uh, strangest reason, because I didn't have my parents were actually very free. Hey, do whatever you want, you know, and just don't get arrested was kind of the rule I, I grew up with. But for whatever reason, I, I had this this a fear of of sexual expression. Um, was very judgmental towards people who were were, were sexual. Um, and so now I know that, okay, that was because I realized there's this thing inside of me that is very, very strong um, that I, I, I don't know how to make sense of it, especially as a teenager. Um, and, and, and to where I wouldn't touch, you know, I was just very kind of afraid to, to get involved in that stuff. Um, and keep in mind, I'm not some you know, out of bounds sexual being. I'm actually pretty vanilla when it comes to those things. I, but I just, I see the power of what it did for me as far as just opening up to it. And, and, um, but okay, back to the, the shadow and the dark, the dark side, what are the things inside of you? If you, you know, for those of you who are listening that you haven't admitted to people, but it, it's just there. Mm. Um, and if you don't explore it, here's, here's what happens at first. It's, it's just a whisper in your head, like, Hey, there's something here that you should explore. And if you push it down, then it becomes, hey, there's something here that you could explore. It gets a little louder and you push it down and it comes back and it gets a little louder. Hey, push it down, it comes back. Hey, push it down, comes back. Hey, and then you're violent. And then before you know it, you're 
you know, a common example, oh, there was a, a governor in, in Minnesota who was anti-gay, 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 and got really, really rah, rah, rah. And he was the one who was caught in the bathroom uh, with a male prostitute in the airport. And um, we see examples of that all the time of where if you don't harness it, it'll lead to some extreme outcome that could com- potentially destroy your life. And, and so it's important to connect with that. And then when you do, there's this sense of freedom uh, similar to uh, a, a gay person coming out, right? And this is big, oh, I'm free. It, it's similar to that, whether you're straight or whatever it might be. Um, uh, and so that's why it's super important to, to explore it because it'll show up in ways where you end up abusing your spouse, addicted to something, running away from this little thing that, that needs to be addressed. Um, so I would encourage everybody, you know, if you can, you know, a, a counselor would be a great place to start journaling. Um, and, and, and my book, I'm not really a salesman, but if you want a story about what can happen when you give yourself permission and, and the book has a mentor in it who coaches the young professor along the way, and you see the professor make lots of mistakes. Um, but it, it's through that coaching that you can see the, the professor learning to accept his dark side, becoming one with it. And then, and then actually learning the powers of it, taking it too far, getting in trouble. And then the mentor pulling you back. And you're in this kind of happy middle ground of, oh, okay, so this is who I am. I'm mm. sure now. Tell me, us more I, about that. Tell us more about the experience. As we, we got about eight minutes left. Okay. Yep. What can people expect to find in your book, The Experience? So um, the, 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 the brief synopsis, real quick, I already kind of covered some of it. 29-year-old professor, teaches dating and relationships, gets cheated on, runs off to Vegas. Um, and is just so confused because everything he's been taught or learned and teaches is not accurate to what he's experiencing. He ends up befriending this this man who becomes his mentor. Uh, it's an older gentleman who's a kind of a street fellow who's very very wise. Um, and this street fellow has has it turns out has taught people how to provide the greatest erotic sensory experience a human being can have. And it's called the ESE, the Erotic Sensory Experience, where it's an erotic experience designed to improve the life of the recipient. And so, you know, on paper, this looks like, well, it's a prostitute and a pimp, but that's really not what's going on. These are well uh, educated people who are using erotic uh, knowledge to improve the life of the recipient. The mentor is wanting to retire and he has a lot of government officials who are basically chasing after him because they don't want this knowledge taught to the world because, again, it empowers people and we don't want anybody empowered, apparently. Um, and so you have this story. And so the, 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 the elderly gentleman t- needs to teach a young man these secrets who won't abuse them. And he realizes that this young professor has what it takes. And so it's the trials and tribulations of this young professor learning all these tips and, and tactics and strategies on how to improve human beings life through erotic sensory experiences. And what I mean by this is, here's an example. Um, you, some people might hear, oh, you know, you know, what, what does it mean to spank your partner? Okay. And, and just for the sake of this example, let's say it's a, a straight male, female, the female, the male it wants to spank the female. Why, why are they doing that? Most people say, oh, it's because they want to own their soul and dominate them. Well, uh, no. To enhance, to really get the brain active, going back to what I, the brain learns by comparing opposites. If, it, if, the, if you want her to feel the softness of the touch, you uh, apply a, somewhat of a stingy or a hard sensation. If you spank her, you're not spanking her to own her soul. You're spanking her so it stimulates the brain to recognize the softness of the touch that follows. And the idea is when you're focused on providing these things, you're so present in the moment and the person receiving, they're not thinking about how am I going to please this person? You just, the person receiving, it's like you're getting a massage, you're focused on receiving. And then they're, they're the one who's providing it does these variety of things basically to wake the brain up, to wake the sensory response system up. And it leads to not only, yes, a great erotic experience, but for weeks that follow, the brain is kind of active in a way where the, all the senses are kind of highlighted to where food tastes better, you know, flowers look prettier, you, you smell things, like it's just this whole thing that is dormant. Um, and so it's about the professor learning this skill set and then having to teach it to the world so people aren't confused about their sexual energy and they don't just see it as reproduction or escapism, but a tool for health, a tool for connectedness, a tool for, for really, you want to improve society? get that down and you'll improve one person at a time and then it'll just spread to, you know, to other people. And so back to that young lady who was mentioning the, the, you know, the, the erotic experience she was having. Um, I hope to teach a lot of men and women this, but women have a sense for it. Men need, need to know 
um, and uh, uh, to really help them to understand there's a way to do this and improve somebody's life. There's a way to masturbate and leads towards life improvement. Um, if you have shame towards erotic expression, it can destroy everything. Right. Um, and, and, and I'd rather you guide you, have you guided towards enlightenment. So the story, it's super fun. Even if you don't like that stuff, there's people that they're asking, is this going to be a Netflix series? I'm, and this one has a male lead character. I'm almost done with the sequel has a female lead character. And she goes through a female version of this learning about some of these secrets. And, and it's actually a detective thriller where she's a detective. And, and as she learns about her sexual self, she gets clues to solve the murder that she's trying to solve. Um, again, going back to how then the eroticism can enhance your brain function. So, um, Man. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. I, I, I see I see another book that you might have to write in the future and empowered through your sexuality. Mm -hmm. When you said the word empowered, it, it really stood out to me. Yeah. Uh, I think we're very infantile in our yeah. evolution as mankind and understanding our own sexuality. And I think that we can use our sexuality to empower ourselves even more versus repress, repress it and feel shame and this and that. Um, I actually look forward to seeing society more become in tune with ourselves, better mm -hmm. understand ourselves, our sexual energy, and how to become empowered through that versus the opposite. So yeah, that's just an idea to plant a seed in your head because you ultimately are showing people how to be empowered through sexuality. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I that's great. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. I'll be curious as the pandemic, you know, moves on how, the next phase of of human existence because. At least for me, I haven't been touched in about 10 months, physically touched. And not just sexually, I'm just saying hugging one of my buddies, you know, like it's, and the book is about the power of human touch. Mm. Um, uh, it very much dives into that, that most criminals, they weren't touched enough as a baby, all that, all that kind of stuff that we know exists. So it'll be interesting how as a society where we can't shake and hug just based on the pandemic, what the response is going to be after that. And, and um, I think that people will, will feel the tingles of hugging, you know, their buddies for the, for the first time in a while, whatever it is. And, and, oh, wow, there's something there. There's some sense of connectedness. I'm hoping that that can lead to, you know, yes, sec better, better sex, but also just better connectedness with friends. And it doesn't have to be sexual. It's just understanding. The right, right. Just in general. Yeah. 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 You know, it's, it's interesting because I guess it could go either way, you know, being cut off for that long could even make us more repressed on yeah. that and people become less of not shaking hands not giving hugs i i'm a personally like i'm a physical touch guy like that's yeah. my love language so yeah, like, yeah i ain't got someone giving me a hug or shaking my hand or rubbing my back now and then yeah like, that, that's that does it for me you know what i mean like so like for me that's a big thing but i see people i've heard people even say yeah after this i'm just i'm not going to shake hands anymore and i just think it's really sad because we were created for connection yeah yeah, I, I will. I'll be spreading the message as best I can that uh, may not be a best strategy. I mean, I and I know they're coming from a, a not wanting to get sick point of view, but um, right. Which yeah. is understandable. I will say, guys, like yeah. I, you know, we got to We have to be smart and we have to work together, you know, to to overcome what we're going through. And, and I'm yeah. an advocate for that. But I think that, you know, physical touch is an important part of, of who we are as human beings. And That's without cool. it, it's interesting when you started talking about it's easier to control somebody the more you take away this. Yeah. And, and that's, that scares me. You know, right. you talked about what Hitler did when he took control. Right. I'm like, man, that's, that's kind of freaky. When you yeah. really think about that, what better way to do that than to lock us all in our homes yeah. and take that away from us. Yeah. 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 So and for those of you who are listening, yeah, if this stuff opens up again and you're on the fence about touch, maybe we can nudge you towards getting back into touch and, I mean, it's got to the point where I'm taking showers just to feel something touch me, you know, and, <laughs> and, and visualize, okay, you know, so, and, and, uh, and I say that slight jokingly, but, but I do, I'm like, okay, at least we can touch right now. <laughs> and right. Not, even, not even sexually, like just to consciously feel something hit my skin and then remind me that I'm a human and I, I have value and, you know, and I have my role on this planet. And so, man, this is great, great stuff. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's kind of funny. My my mom, she watches all my shows <laughs> and she goes, very interesting topic. I enjoyed it. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. Well, just yeah, my mom hasn't read my book, but but she's she's gave it to all her friends. <laughs> she, I don't want to read, you know, so I, I I get it. So right on, mom. High five. I got you. <laughs> well, you know, as we're at the end of the show, um, yeah. Brandon, how can first of all, where can we find your book at? How can we support you? How can people read the experience? Okay, so Amazon, um, it, uh, 
yeah, the experience. There we go. Um, if you type in the experience, Brandon, it'll be, it'll pop up and you'll see the girl's eyes that'll, you know, if you just type in the experience, I don't know, but type in the experience Brandon on Amazon, you can go to brandonwadebooks.com. That's my website. And it has the, the link, a little bit of a breakdown towards me, um, uh, uh, about me. Um, and actually on the website, there's a, a, if you put your email in and I hate those things where they want your email, but I don't email a bunch of stuff. It's just to let you know when my second book is coming out. But if you do do that, there is a PDF on, um, basically, uh, how to, uh, use the masturbation manifestation technique that I described in this. And, um, um, and that's something that that's free if you want to check it out. But if you don't, that's fine too. Again, I don't do a bunch of emails. I'm not a big time marketer guy, I'm much more focused on the craft. And then, uh, I, on social media, uh, Brandon Wade, um, underscore author is my, uh, my Instagram. And then, and then lastly, I, I've been, a, uh, totally separate from that. What you might see when you go on my, my sites is that I'm also a DJ. I've been a DJ for 25 years. Uh, DJ Brandon Wade, and I have a, a SoundCloud page where basically I make workout mixes for people, um, and it just passed the 10 million download point um, this last week. So that's something that gyms all over the world are using these Don't things. Don't do something more interesting though than just make. There's something special. We talked about this when we did yeah. the call. Yeah. What's so, unique about it? So what, what what's unique about it is I infuse neuroscience into the mix. So it's all it's top 40. There's new hip hop and, and and rock and 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 all kinds of different genres and EDM and all that stuff. Um, but what I do is knowing that nuance, nuance is the most important thing to trigger the brain to release dopamine. Nuance is where you take something familiar and you just add a little difference to it. So nuance doesn't mean totally brand new. It's there's something that you're somewhat familiar with and it has something unique about it. Again, bring nuance to your relationships. For those of you who are in relationships with the sex act is a way to enjoy the sex by bringing in some new stuff. But um, musically, uh, what I do is I make what are called mashups where you take the beat of one song and the lyrics of a different song, you put them together and I put those in a mix. And so for people, when they're going to the gym and they're doing the same thing they've done for a thousand times, when a new mix comes on uh, with a mashup of Aerosmith over, you know, Calvin Harris with, with 50 Cent rapping in the background or whoever, or Pop Smoke or whoever, the brain goes fit, 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 just lights up with dopamine and that's what gets people you know addicted to fitness assuming they like the the, the songs that are mashed together but uh, that's why it's it's been pretty successful so yeah my whole thing is finding better ways you know to do stuff and take you know you know the what might be boring right, and, I might and have, exciting. You, man, have you make me a mashup that you yeah. know like my favorite, you know, artists and music and mesh yeah. together. I'm all about getting my brain to fire on all cylinders. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And so um, I encourage yeah, people to check that out. If you just Google DJ Brandon Wade, there'll be a bunch of stuff that, that pops up and you guys can, you know, check that out. Um, and, and that's something that I'll, I'll be doing. I always have to be doing something if it's either DJing or writing or performing or whatever it is. I'm always doing stuff. So. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, man, Brandon, it's, it's been a, it's been an incredible show. Uh, I just want to thank you for your time, for coming on the show, for sharing your wisdom with all of us. We're very yeah. grateful for it. And uh, for everyone else out there, you know, I will actually, I like to do this and I want to do it with you as well. If there was one last piece of advice that you could leave us with, mm -hmm. what would that piece of advice be? It's, it, you know, it sounds cliche, but self-knowledge self know yourself but it, not the traditional way go go to where your dark side is and see if there's rules that need to be broken for you to know yourself that's the really where the good stuff is it's not just doing what your parents said so seek self knowledge in a way that may not be the traditional route go beyond your comfort zone and 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 then you know become a geek about it there's so much science coming out that can help you understand yourself more effectively again with, it, with things that you're being taught to repress question it and, and see what their motivation might be and then try to get to the truth of yourself. That's, that's why we're, that's why I think we're on this earth as an individual, like to know who the heck you are, right? Mm -hmm. Are you, are you going to the dark places to figure that out? Cause that's where the good stuff is. Mm. Yeah, man. It reminds me of, you know, ancient philosopher Socrates said, know thyself then master thyself. Yeah. Yeah. Start self-awareness guys. Make sure that we're doing that inner work. We're yeah. learning. Who are you? What do you like? What don't you like? And really become in tune with that. And, and it really, there's, and I think it comes from uncomfortable situations. Um, if you know, it really, and so for me going to Vegas, I, I cried in front of a strip club. It sounds silly, but that was so uncomfortable for me. <laughs> and that's where it went boom. And then I went on this path that ended up, and at that time I didn't think I was going to be an author. No way. But it, it opened up. I finally felt alive 
after being willing to explore my dark side. So yeah, please go to the depths of your self knowledge, whatever, whatever that might be. Mm, good stuff, Brandon. Thank you, brother. And yeah. guys, thank you everybody that tuned into the show. Everybody that watches the replay or checks us out on YouTube, make sure you go follow Brandon, make sure you support him. Highly encourage you to get his book. I'm lucky. I got a signed copy. Hey <laughs> So I haven't read it yet, but I'm looking forward to diving deep and reading the experience. I'm a big reader. Uh, definitely going to enjoy reading through that book and learning more about myself. And guys, remember, every single week at the same time we go live with the show, I bring on an awesome guest just like we had Brandon today. So make sure you guys are tuning in, you're plugging in, and I'll see you next week. All right.